Hi, this is Eric from longboxreview.com. Welcome to the show and welcome to a long anticipated return show. Uh, we, uh, we were supposed to do this show last year, but life got in the way. But here we are back for 2022. It is the Christmas Gab Bag episode with my good friend George from Meanwhile at the podcast. Hey, George, Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas to you too, Eric. How you doing? <laughs> well, much better now this year as compared to last year <laughs> at this time. Uh, so yeah, I, uh, I'm uh, very pleased that uh, you decided to come back a year later and, and do this gab bag. Well, thank you. Me too. I, I've been looking forward to it since basically January 1st of this year. <laughs> So yeah, this is our uh, for people who may not know. Since we 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 had a skip year, I, and I wish you know, like many things, I could say uh, thanks a lot, COVID. But uh, <laughs> unfortunately, it wasn't that. It was some other thing that I'm not going to talk about here. Um, uh, but this is this is our fifth gab bag. It would have been our sixth had we had we done this last year because we had our first one in 2017, and then we've been doing it every year since then. Yeah, I, I look forward to it every year. Yeah. And uh, so what is the Christmas gab bag? Some people might be asking, George. Uh, that's just where George and I get together and talk about Christmas comics or Christmas-related comics, as, as the case may be. Uh, George tends to surprise me a little bit and uh, bring up some really interesting comic books that have some connection to Christmas in some fashion. So I'm very curious. George has already told me what these uh, comics are, but um, I don't. I don't think I know them. I don't. I've, I've not read these. I don't think. Uh, I'm, I'm going from memory here, George. So <laughs> uh, you have to forgive me if, if I if I actually come back later and say, "Oh yeah, that one. I've read that one." <laughs> uh, but we're going to talk about uh, uh, a few. I'll say I'm not sure exactly how many or how much inf or how deep we're going to get into these particular issues. I know one of the comics of mine that we'll get to here in a bit. There are five different stories, short stories in it, but I'm not going to talk about all five. I'll just mention them real briefly, but I'm going to focus on just a couple. So I don't know what's going on with, with what George is going to talk about. So this, it'll be, this is, think of this episode as kind of like a Christmas gift. You know, it's all packaged nice and neat under the Christmas tree, the shiny paper and the, and the wonderful bow and, and whatnot. And you go to open it and who knows, what could it be? It's like a Christmas stocking. And you're just digging deep and deep in, hoping that there's just that one more little gift at the bottom. And folks, I hope you didn't read the show notes already, because now it's like opening your mm, Christmas present. You know, true. you found them in mom's closet. So <laughs> don't do that. We're going to surprise you here with all the fun stuff we're going to talk about today. Well, George, I guess with, with the preamble out of the way, shall we get into some Christmas gab bagging? Yes, I believe we should. All right, shall we? Let, let's just dive right in. What is your okay, first uh, Christmas oh, we're, comic? Oh, we're, yeah, that's. Uh, first, I, I guess huh? we should okay, have talked about great. this before we started recording. Huh? Hey, listen, <laughs> it's like we're sitting in front of the tree and we're trying to decide who's going to hand out the gifts. It all happens <laughs> organically. That's right. All right, so uh, as you can hear, I'm taking it out of the bag, bag and board. I'm, so, like, I'm opening my presents. If you can hear that. <laughs> All right, George. Wait. Uh, all right, so my... why why you're doing that? Are are you one of those kind of uh, gift openers that very meticulously unfolds the paper and 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 takes uh, you know uh, the edge where it's taped and makes sure that the, the paper doesn't get ripped and you take the tape off and all that stuff and you unfold the paper so that you can use it again? No, I'm not <laughs> one of those people, and I think those people definitely need help. Although I don't, I shouldn't say that because I think my co-host Kristen opens her gifts that way. And I don't think Kristen needs any sort of help. So I, I, I guess, you know, different strokes, different folks. You take the good, you take the bad, you take them both, and there you have the facts of life. And now I'm going off on a weird sitcom tangent as opposed to a Christmas tangent. So let me bring it back in. Oh, wait. So you know, one more tangent, George, because uh, sure. I, I, uh, I neglected to have you inform the listeners, we've already talked all the, all about the Christmas gab bag and the history and blah, 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 blah. But yeah, that's why, they don't want to hear about that's that. That's why we're here. They want to hear <laughs> about you and and the show that you co-host with 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 Kristen and some others, the Meanwhile at the Podcast podcast. Oh, yes. So why don't you just tell them real quick what uh, what that is all about and where they can find you. Thank you, Eric. I will I will definitely do that. That is a Christmas present to me to let other people know about <laughs> us because nobody knows about us. 
My name is George. I am one of four co-hosts of Meanwhile at the Podcast. We are a weekly show, and kind of like Eric, who has so many different imprints, uh, it could be a comic show one week for Eric, and then another week it could be the gutters, and then he could surprise us with center seat. Our show talks about, we, we talk about everything. We're like a radio show. I like to think of us as a radio show. And when you tune into our show, sure you have an idea of what we're going to talk about. We're probably going to talk about things we've watched and uh, books and comics we've read, music we've listened to, things that have happened in our lives. But you never quite know which way a conversation is going to go. And it's in, in and of itself, it is a gab bag every week. It's a grab bag of gab bags. <laughs> we drop our episodes every Saturday morning. So please check us out on your podcast apps. If you haven't, subscribe. Sample our show. And just to let you know, I am a very obsessive, compulsive person. And just because Eric could not do the gab bag last year, I did the gab bag by myself. My first solo show, Eric, you, you didn't give me my report card grade on that. Then my first solo A plus episode. George. No, thank you. So <laughs> I, there is a gab bag from last year in our feed. If you want to check that out in our archives, if you're looking for more Christmas related content. Oh, and even though there's a crazed billionaire that owns Twitter right now for, for the moment, <laughs> the best way to get us on social media is at Meanwhile ATP on Twitter, although we are at Meanwhile ATP on Instagram and Meanwhile the podcast on Facebook, although we don't really use those platforms that much right now. But maybe in 2023, we will be diving back into those platforms. And I know uh, my co-host, Rodney, oh, I didn't even mention my co-hosts, Rodney, Kristen, and Rich. I know Rodney is going on to, I think, Hive right now. You'll hear, you'll hear all about it on, on our show if you, if you check us out. Uh, Rodney is a graphic artist that goes by the name Art Nerd with two R's in the word nerd. And Kristen and Rich are a married couple that used to own uh, be part owners of a comic book store right now they they are are not part owners of that store but they have a heavy background in comics which helps for our comic conversations all right thank thank you george all righty so back to christmas comics yes and if you if you do recall i was i went off on a sitcom tangent before you reminded me that i should talk about my show ah uh, okay yes I, I gave the different strokes theme a little bit, the facts of life. That's theme. right. Mm -hmm. Well, there might've been a reason for that. <laughs> and to be honest, to be honest with you, that was serendipitous because there really wasn't a reason for that. But I noticed that, wow, it fits in with my first book because my first book is the supersized Alf holiday special number two. Now far be it for me to bring number one to the table. I'm bringing number two to the table. And uh, this is, I don't know, can you see that cover? I know your, your listeners can't see this, but it is Alf, the famous alien life form from the planet Melmac. He is on a sleigh with a bunch of other Melmacians that appear in this book. And if you can see, Eric, you might see some ex-Melmacian, ex-Melmen. I don't know what they're called. I'll have to look at my notes. But you might see... Uh, person from Melmac that looks like Colossus, perhaps one that looks like Rogue, perhaps uh -huh, one yeah. that looks like Groucho Marx. Mm -hmm. there, there are all sorts of uh, Melmac residents who look like some of our pop culture icons. <laughs> and one of the themes for the books that I have this year is A, pop culture references, which kind of falls in tune to my show. Exactly. And B, one of the things you alluded to when you introduced what we were doing here with the gab bag. My track record of bringing books to the table that, by accident, aren't always holiday feet. <laughs> now, now, trust me. Yes. Listen, I, I got burned by Fantastic Four volume, what was it, volume two, number four, mm -hmm. with the Christmas cover, and it had nothing to do with Christmas. I got burned that year. Right. We both got burned. <laughs> it, it had nothing to do with John Byrne, just to let everybody know. All these books that I'll be talking about today do have holiday stories in them, but of course they have to throw in something non-holiday, which I, I, don't, I don't know how I feel about that. If you're going to have a, a Christmas cover, especially something that says holiday special on it, every story should have to do with the holidays, a December holiday. Yeah. 
this is why I think next year, Eric, when we do this, it's all going to be Archie comics, like Benny and Veronica's stocking <laughs> stuffer, yeah. Archie's Christmas grab bag, because every every story is holiday related. Mm-hmm. So I think that it's going to be all Archie all the time next year. But anyway, here we have <laughs> the ALF holiday special. Now, if I get my notes over here, because I'm trying, I'm not going to go page by page in here, but let's let's just talk about the pedigree here. This is from winter 1990. And on my show, I've mentioned this before. One of the things that I think is missing in comics today is a, are good humor comics. And not the good humor ice cream. I'm talking fun, humorous comics that we can all just sit back and laugh at. And here's a guy, me in my mid-50s, reading a book that was probably from the star line of Marvel Comics back in the 90s. Things like Heathcliff were coming out from this. Uh, what else did they have? Uh, Ewoks, Care Bears, things like that. Oh, yeah. And, and here, these are the things I'm longing for. I, I, I don't know why, but they're simple. But I'm telling you, I enjoyed this book immensely. It, it, it was making me laugh. And what I'd like to do is I, I will focus on the holiday-themed stories in here. And the only reason I'm even going to touch on, very briefly, the non-holiday-themed stories is just to point out some of the fun pop culture references. Now, were you aware of the ALF holiday specials? Like I said, this is number two. So the the first one had come out the previous winter. No, I I, I knew there was a comic book starring ALF, but I did mm-hmm. not realize that there were holiday specials. And I think that's another thing that we're missing. Comics that are licensed from television shows, which I know is hard to do these days since of all the, we have all the streaming services and it's not that we have only three or four networks with TV shows that everybody can watch at the same time. So we we're all guaranteed to know every show. Like, even if you didn't watch Alf back in the day, you knew Alf existed. There was no way you could avoid Mm. Alf and and merchandise in the stores. Uh, And uh, the same thing with uh, like uh, back when Dell comics or gold key comics would have star Trek or something like Gunsmoke, Adam 12, even if, if those comics were very short lived, there's something about having a, a TV themed comic, mm-hmm. and I, I miss that in, in today's world. So it was very refreshing to pick this up after almost uh, well, yeah, thirty years. Wow! And, and re and reread this book. Let's get into it. All right. So for for those of you who don't know, Alf was a TV show that ran for four seasons from 1986 to 1990. I love this show, and whenever I read this this comic. I I really don't remember too much about any of the characters except for Alf himself and Willie Tan, the patriarch of the household where Alf lives. Mm-hmm. And whenever they spoke in the book, I heard their voices, the, the actors' voices in my head, which I, I – do you do that when you read like a Star oh, yeah. Trek comic? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And Alf's voice to me is iconic. If you've ever watched Alf before, there's no way I'm going to try and imitate him. Uh, but if you know Alf's voice, you if you read this comic, reading it in his voice with the jokes that they put in here adds that little extra flavor of fun mm-hmm. to hear it in Alf's voice. The first story, luckily it opens with a holiday story, is Don't Toy With Me. And the premise is pretty simple. Alf and Willie are going to go Christmas shopping. Willie parks the car far away from the mall because he can't find a parking space. Uh, and kids, if you don't know what a mall is, a mall is a brick and mortar <laughs> store where people would go shopping prior to us shopping on the internet, just to let everybody know what a mall is. Willie leaves Alf in the car because Alf is an alien life form and he would be recognized immediately as a furry orange alien. Alf stays in the car, Willie goes shopping, and of course, somebody steals the car. Willie had left the keys in the car so Alf could listen to the radio and a guy comes over, breaks into the car, goes, oh, great, there are keys in the car. This is easy. And he, he drives off, and Alf acts like a stuffed animal. Coincidentally enough, Alf had been flossing his teeth while Willie was driving to the mall. So Al used the dental floss to make it look like it was a, a pull string. You know how they have on dolls so that right. the doll will talk? So he used that as a pull string to make it sound like he was going to talk, and he was uh, talking in rhyme, which reminded me of the demon. Uh, from DC Comics. Oh, and by the way, this is from Marvel Comics, Marvel Comics Starline. I don't mm-hmm. think I mentioned that. Uh, so 
Alf tries to convince the car thief to change his ways. And somehow he finds out in the conversation that he has as, as the doll with the person in the car that the guy has uh, issues with his family and he has been shunned by his family because of his way of life, his, his, uh, his life of crime. And because it's the holidays, he starts remembering times with his mom and he goes to a payphone, calls his mom and says, mom, I'm, I'm ready to change my life. Can I come home now? And of course she says, yes. He forgets about the car. Alf starts the car, drives it back to the mall. And he goes, just in time, Willie's coming back. And Willie gets in the car. And of course he uh, notices the car's out of gas. <laughs> uh, so anyway, that's, that's the premise of that story there. So a nice, fun holiday story. But I'd like to throw at you some of the pop culture references and some of the things that the writer did that just put this one over the top for me, that, that it's more than what I just said. To let you know, this is written by Michael Gallagher, and the penciler is Dave Manick. Uh, I think they did most of the work in this book, but the name that stuck out to me was the inker of this particular story, and this is the only one she inked, was Marie Severin. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, that's and, I had no idea she did <laughs> Alf comics. I know. Who, who would have known, right? Uh, but uh, I do want to throw some of the uh, the fun pop culture references in here uh, to you. So just to date it, whenever Alf makes references to pop culture I icons, he usually throws in Mel. So it's like a Mel Mackie, something like that. So like Jack Mella Lane, I, I, to say it out loud is kind of hard. So <laughs> instead of Jack Lane, and yeah. I don't even know if ha half our listeners know who, <laughs> who Jack Lane yeah. was, right? Yeah. <laughs> And he and, and this part, I, you know, I don't remember if he did this in the show, but in the comic, throughout the comic, he made different exclamations uh, of Great Caesar's ghost. Mm. So in this particular story, he said, Great Caesar's coast deodorant soap, which is a real deodorant soap, by the way, folks. <laughs> and, and throughout the comic, he would say different things uh, like, I don't know, maybe he said, uh, Great Caesars, Ghostbusters 2, or something like that. You, you, you know, just things like that he would throw out there that were, uh, at the time, you, you, you know, they were popular at the time, but now that you're reading it 30 years later, uh, some people may not know what these references are. In fact, I even wonder if some of them went over my head, because they came fast and furious. Well, I, I just think it's, it's, it's funny that he uses Great Caesars Ghost, which is, you know, Perry White's saying from Superman, right? Yep, and there are some uh, <laughs> there are some DC references in here, by the way, and I'm going to throw them out at you mm. as, they, as they come along. On the fourth page, there's the first editor's note and meta reference that happens throughout the book, which um, I didn't expect. He's in the car, and he's thinking to himself, holy crumola, this guy thinks I'm a toy. Say, I did masquerade as a toy back in the issue Kate referred to. What was my name? So earlier in the story, Kate, the mom of the story, makes a reference to something Alf did in the past. She says, now, Willie, we don't want another alien related incident like last year. And then there's an editorial note, Alf holiday special number one. Which you could expect from comics from back in that time, those editor's notes, right? Mm -hmm. I love those. But here, Alf makes a reference to the editor's note by saying the issue Kate referred to. What was my name? And in the editor's note, it says Fuzzy Philip. So in the next panel, Alf goes, oh, yeah, thanks, Ed, because it says uh, <laughs> instead of editor, it says Ed. And things like that happen throughout the comic where there are references to the caption boxes. Mm-hmm. Which is a lot of fun. And, yeah, yeah. you know, if you were a kid back then, I mean, kind of stuff like that's kind of cool. That's all there really is about about this particular holiday story. Although I will, you know, when you and I have the actual issue in front of us instead of a collected edition, we like to point out the ad. So there was an ad in the middle of this story for action figures from Star Trek V, The Final Frontier. Ooh. They were collector's figures from the San Francisco Mint. Now, when I see things like this, I'm always wondering, did anybody order this? Yeah. You know, I'd love to know somebody who ordered this because I don't think I've ever seen anything like this at a convention or anything like that. 
there was Captain Kirk, Mr. Spock, Bones, Cybok, and Claw. And you could order them separately, or you can order a set of five and get a free poster. And each one of them had a little diorama that you could pose the figure in. I love stuff like that when you're when you're reading the original issues. Yeah. And in fact, uh, in the I was just thumbing through, since you mentioned that, I was just thumbing through the issue I'm going to talk about next. And it's got it's got uh, similar ads like that where I'm like, I was like, do people actually order these things? I know. Who, I who, love that. Because I, I, I didn't know anybody who ordered any of them, but I, I would have if I would have had the money back then, I would have. That's true. Yeah. Yeah. I would have definitely been one of those people to cut the thing out of the comic and send my money in. What? George, that's that's crazy. Talk. That's that's a that's that's a bridge too far for me. Well, back then, I, I <laughs> even back I, then, I may, I may not have had an access, uh, any access to a uh, photocopier or anything like that. <laughs> but let's move on to have yourself a melly little Christmas. So that's the fourth story here. This one actually features Santa, Santa, and the problem here is. Santa appears to Alf and says that his reindeer have been quarantined due to a big Lyme disease epidemic that was going on. And since deer carry carry ticks, which carry Lyme disease, he was being shut down by the health department because he couldn't let the deer go out in case they were infected with Lyme <laughs> disease. So he needed Alf to take up his role from, again, another previous ALF issue as the superhero, the Fantastic Fur. He has an anti-gravity belt that I guess he has from the planet Melmac, and he, I'm not sure if he used that in the show. Maybe, maybe that's something he used in the show or just a, in the comics. He dons the kitchen tablecloth, and he can fly using his anti-gravity belt. So ALF is reluctant to do it, but then Santa says, you know, well, he'll he'll wipe out some of the things Alf, Alf did during the year to take him off the naughty list and put him on the list. You know, all things are forgiven. And Alf's like, it's a deal. But Alf can't figure out how Santa got to Alf's house if all the reindeer are quarantined. Get this one, Eric. Donald Trump sent me a free round trip on uh. his executive helicopter. And there's a helicopter with a T on it with the... Uh, Kind of like that gold embossment around. <laughs> <laughs> then Alf asks, but Santa, you can't accept a bride. Now get this, 1990. Okay, you ready? Mm -hmm. Winter 1990. I prefer to call it a campaign contribution. Uh... Ho, ho, home, James. <laughs> yeah, so I, I think when Gorman, the barbecue barian, when time traveling to the Mel Marx brothers offices, maybe they also time travel <laughs> to the, uh, the 20 teens and the 20 twenties uh, and went back and wrote this comic. Oh boy. That's that, that that's a little too close for comfort there, George. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, there's one more reference in here where, uh, and then this reference actually is, is way obscure. I think for, for 1990, Al falls and hits his head. And he says, I'm dizzier than Goldie Hawn in her laugh-in days. Now, that's a reference in 1990. Because I, I, I know laugh-in was in syndication for a little while, but I don't think they were in syndication in the late 80s. I, I, I seem to – yeah, I seem to recall watching them in syndication like when I was in high school. So I don't, I don't, I don't really think – I think they got bumped off for more current – things in syndication. So mm. I think the laugh in reference was really for the parents. Oh yeah. Rather than a kid reading reading this book. But in the end they they deliver all the presents and uh their jokes abound, hijinks ensue as uh as our friend Brian Loy from the Alamo Draft House always says. And when Alf wakes up, he thinks it was all a dream. But of course, there's a present under the tree from Santa and it says to Gordon from your uncle, Chris Kringle. So it was a thank you gift for being the fantastic fur to help him deliver all the gifts. But let's get to the last story in here. Alf in For Goodness Snakes. This is a New Year's story. They are ringing in 1990. 
In fact, let's see, uh, what were the exact words here? Well, here's to health and happiness to one and all as we enter the 90s. Those were the days, right, Eric? Entering the 90s. <laughs> <laughs> Alf had brought a uh, snake into the house for some convoluted reason that has to do with something that happens on Melmac every like 78 years because they were going into 1990 here on Earth. There was something about snakes that they would do on Melmac. He had a snake in the house, and of course, everybody's like, you got to get that snake out of the house, Alf. Of course, the snake escapes, and the story is all about them trying to find the snake. Now, remember earlier on, I told you that the mom was the disciplinarian. She was the strict mm -hmm, one right. in the house. Well, she was very, very mad at Alf, and she was giving him a—you have 10 minutes to get that snake out of the house, or else, you know, instead of us bopping the snake with a bat, we're bopping you with a bat, or, <laughs> or whatever the consequences were. She gets him in the kitchen and she says, Alf, over the years, I've endured many things. Reduce a roni, personality swap, eat off the floor day, influenza. So instead of influenza, it was influenza. Mm -hmm. Rapunzel, Rapunzel rinse, clogged veins, but this is the last straw. After each of the, these references, there are different marks, asterisks, period, and exclamation point. And there's an editor's note at the bottom indicating which issues of ALF all of these things occur. Uh -huh. ALF turns to us, the reader, and says, wow, that might be a new world's record for back issue plugging. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, of course, they, uh, they get rid of the snake and they ring in 1990. And then ALF says, well, you know, let's be prepared next year for something that has to do with elephants. So. Uh, that's something to look forward to if there was ever an ALF uh, holiday special number three. But that is the supersized ALF holiday special. Three out of six <laughs> stories in it are holiday related. And it's not quite the meatloaf song I like to quote, but hey, three out of six ain't bad. Well, I, George, I don't know how I can even follow that because uh, my my pick my first pick of the of the of the of the episode is a little more, shall I say? I'll just say mainstream. <laughs> wait, wait, Al's not mainstream. Come uh, on, man. Al probably it was mainstream for that very brief period. Yeah, of time. that's true. Very true. <laughs> well, you know, my my holiday, my Christmas comics tend to be more on the on the DC side uh, usually because that's that's more of what I read back in the day. Uh, more, uh, stuff that I was more interested in. Uh, and this is no different because this is, I'll show George here on the video, but this is uh, DC special series number 21. Uh, can you see that, George? Yes. Ooh, I remember that. Issue. Yeah. The Superstar oh. Holiday Special from uh, the cover date 1980, but it was published on December 6th, 1979. And mm. and I'll just show you that real quick, George, on the back cover. Another yeah, another Star Trek reference. Star Trek the motion picture. Mm -hmm. Uh now playing at a theater near you, which of course it was, well, the next day that uh that this comic came out, because December seventh, nineteen seventy nine is when the motion picture debuted. Okay, I'm out. <laughs> I'm running to the theater right now. <laughs> <laughs> well, I certainly did. <laughs> anyway, so uh, this this is uh, I think this is um, one of those kind of iconic covers from uh, DC Comics past, right? Because you've got uh, this is by uh, Jose Luis Garcia Lopez, and you've got uh, the uh, members of the Legion of Superheroes, Jonah Hex, Sergeant Rock, Batman, and uh, various people from the House of Mystery or their you know their mystic titles at that time, all. Uh, heading towards a, a a star shining bright in the night in the distance, and uh, so what we got here is a a one of those wonderful dollar comics, five all new stories featuring those characters, and so let me let me just read this uh, opening page for you to give you a. Oh wait, sense they, they of were it. all new stories. None of them were reprints. No, the, uh, as far as I know, they these are all new. Yeah. Oh, cool. So kind of the way they do it today, where they'll. I mean, the the ones today are what eighty pages with ten stories or something like that, mm -hmm. and and they're usually all new. I I didn't realize this one was all new. cool. Um. Oh, but uh, before I get to that, actually, uh, this is so this is one of those Christmas specials 
uh, in my collection that I was happy to find. This is not something that I purchased back in December of 1979 because my money was uh, being uh, spent at the movie theater to watch Star Trek The Motion Picture <laughs> later that month. <laughs> but uh, but I found this. I'm sure I paid, I don't know, a dollar or two for this, this, this issue uh, at uh, probably Emerald City Comic Con, probably mm. in 2016. Oh, you only really recently, yeah. relatively recently acquired it. Yeah, exactly. So, but but I remember seeing this in either ads or maybe even on, or uh, yeah, in a spinner rack at, at some grocery store back then. Um, you know, but mm. it was a dollar. And comics back then, normal price comics back then were uh, were thirty five cents when I was when I was reading them. So you know, a dollar that's. Uh, that's three times the price, and I, you know, I could buy three comics for that. So <laughs> about, you know. Anyway, so uh, but but I got that, and um, uh, you know, why one of the things I love about reading these these comics like this is that it was published around the same time that I started getting into comics. You know, the uh-huh. the very late seventies, early eighties. So I really enjoy visiting that time period. Um, and, and although this is this is uh, like I say, Christmas themed. So here mm. here's the the opening page of this. The midnight sky is an infinite tapestry woven with pinpoint patterns of stars that shine in eternal profusion. I, I just the the, the, the overwrought language is just, is just lovely. But there is one star that shines more brightly than the rest. On a wintry night, almost two thousand years ago, three wise and weary kings of ancient lands followed that brightly shining star to a sheltered stable in the village of Bethlehem, and the world would never again be the same. On that self-same night in centuries since, uh, the star is shown again over war-torn Italy, over the snow-swept Colorados, over bustling Gotham City, over a, sh- a ramshackle Kentucky mansion, and over a world that is yet to be the star has made its presence felt. Come along now with the world's greatest heroes, although that's kind of stretching it with some of these characters, to follow that star and your world, too, may never again be the same. So, you know, maybe maybe uh, overdoing it just a little bit. Uh, I was just about to say I miss stuff like that. More of that, please. <laughs> More of that, please. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I I, I, I admit, I, 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 too, am like, it's like, oh, that's, you know, I, I remember reading I know, comics yeah. like that, you know, written like this, but, you know, eh, yeah. maybe a little just uh, overdone. <laughs> All right. So, like I said, uh, five all new stories in here. And uh, uh, just like a, a star has five points, you know, we get these five stories, five stories involving a star. So, uh, like I said, uh, at the near the top of the show, I, I there are several, there are five stories here, but uh, I'm only going to talk in depth about two of them. But real quick, uh, the the Jonah Hex story is the one that opens it up. Uh, this is where uh, a star allows Jonah Hex to find some bad guys, and then he blows them up. So you know, traditional Christmas fair. Yeah, that's right up there. Yeah, <laughs> isn't that the similar theme to uh, Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer? <laughs> that's right. Uh, speaking of, I guess uh, uh, what, what's the? Oh shoot, what's the term? Oh, vigilantism. <laughs> that's what I'm like. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the next story <laughs> is Batman. In a story called Want, uh, "Wanted Santa Claus Dead or Alive," uh, so a star in the story, a you know, a quote unquote star, points the way for Batman to save a repentant mall Santa who's who's uh, a former thief and trying to turn over a new leaf, who's about to be killed by some other gangster type people that are coercing him into helping them steal some stuff from, I think, a mall. Yeah, the, I did say mall. Repentant mall Santa. Um, what's interesting about this, George, is that uh, not not the star, not Batman so much, but this is the first time that Frank Miller drew Batman for DC Comics in this issue. Ah, who would have, you know who would think these things, right? His first, yeah, his first work on Batman. Although to me, it kind of looks a little bit like. Oh boy, I'm blanking. Oh, Marshall Rogers. That's who I'm thinking of. Oh, okay. And mm-hmm. I think may, that might have to do uh, more to do with uh, the the uh, the inker than anything else. Mm. But I but I I, me- I meant to look that up to see if the inker uh, also inked Marshall Rogers. I don't. I did not do that. But anyway, so like I said, uh, Frank Miller's first work. So 
like I said, I paid, you know, maybe a dollar or two for this issue at the Comic-Con, George. I looked it up for a a fine 6.0 copy of this issue. Uh-huh. How, how much do you think it's it's going for these days? Well, non-slabbed, of course. See, right, <laughs> seeing seeing how this conversation is going, I'm 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 tempted to say a nickel, but <laughs> <laughs> but 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 I, I I will I will say um five bucks. Oh. Eighty. Eighty bucks. Eighty bucks. Nice. Good. And I'm glad it is. That's one website I looked at. So you know, prices yeah. fluctuate mm-hmm. and all that stuff. But still a, right. a six point oh copy for eighty bucks and I I got this, which is you know, it's probably good to find. It's you know, not too bad for and, a few bucks. And the way you were looking at me and kind of the way you were wording that question i was under the impression that you were going to tell the, the moral of the story was you overpaid and i i wouldn't i wouldn't think that you overpaid and actually to be honest with you okay 80 bucks might be a little you know a little high i guess but you don't really like for instance this year's square bound 80 page or 100 page giant is called grifter got run over by a reindeer mm-hmm. that's that's the holiday dc comic this year right and i think i prefer to have that five story comic in your hand right there i have the feeling i would get more enjoyment out of that than grifter got run over by yeah, maybe mm-hmm. maybe i once yeah. once that gets onto the dc uh universe infinite app i'll uh i'll read that and i'll let you know but okay thank you because <laughs> i know i'm not reading it <laughs> I, I have to say the, the this Batman story was like yeah, it was okay. It was, it was it it seemed like it was really trying hard to fit the whole star theme into it. So anyway, uh, the next story in here, which is interesting, who wrote, who wrote that? Oh, uh, this was written by Denny O'Neill. Oh, was it? Okay. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, and did did you mention who wrote and no uh, drew the uh, I did John X? No. So uh, it was drawn by Dick Ayers and Romeo Tangle, and Michael oh. Fleischer is the writer, with Gene oh, okay. De- D'Angelo as the colorist, and oh. Shelley Lefferman as letterer, which some of these names, um, like Shelley Lefferman, I, I'd never encountered that name before, at least not, not, not that I recall. Yeah, most of those names, like in that, that ALF book, I wasn't surprised that I didn't know. Yeah. Because I think a lot of those artists are probably maybe uh, kids or I don't know what I would they probably weren't drawing too many superhero comics also or or writing yeah. them but Marie Severn's name popped out on that first one yeah and Steve Mitchell was the uh the inker on that uh, that Batman story with Glynis Ween uh colorist and Ben Oda with, uh, those mm-hmm. are names I do know except for Steve Mitchell yeah <laughs> Anyway, but at the time you wouldn't have known Frank Miller more than likely. Oh no, no, right? right? Not, we, we wouldn't well, know that name, would we? Have? At that time, because no, no, I think I think he went to Daredevil after that, because I think I think Denny O'Neill left DC shortly after that, and then um, he brought Frank Miller on, uh, okay. or or at least gave Frank Miller the opportunity to do more writing on Daredevil. I see. So hmm. at least that's according to the the stuff that I read. <laughs> right research that you actually yes. did yes. as opposed to anything i did yeah. well you know it's it's just like oh that's interesting what's the what's the story behind that so then i start doing yeah. stuff but uh that jonah hex story and the batman story were 10 pages each yes mm. so 10 pages each this next story this is the one i wanted to focus on uh first out of the, of the two uh, in this in this five story anthology uh this is the house of mystery story which is only eight pages Oh. Uh, drawn by Romeo Tangle and Dan Adkins. So Romeo Tangle doing the frontman uh, work, so to speak. Uh, usually, yeah. you know, he's known as an inker for, for example, for George Perez on New Teen Titans. That's how yeah, I know that's him. That's how I, I yeah. Yeah. Uh, Bob Rosakis was the writer. You know, Bob Rosakis was the answer man. And we mm-hmm. we get a we get a uh, an answer man entry at the at the end of this this uh, issue. So I'll, I'll get to that later. But oh, fun. Uh, Bob LaRose, the colorist. And Shelley Leverman letters. So, you know, again, two names I don't really know. Anyway, hmm. so the House of Mystery entry, we got Cain and Abel, the three witches. Oh. From, oh, shoot. What is the name of their comic? It wasn't The Witching Hour, was it? The Witching Hour. Thank you. That's that's exactly oh, okay. it. Uh, they're Cynthia, Mildred, and Mordred. I had to look up Ooh, uh, I didn't know some of their Yeah. That Mordred is mentioned by name in the story, but I don't, and maybe Cynthia, but I don't think Mildred was. Anyway. 
Hmm. Uh, and Destiny all have gathered. Uh, DC had a Destiny character? Yes. And what, did Destiny appear in some other horror book or something like that? Or or, or was she – like, is Destiny he or is she? Is she? No. It, it's it's the male version of, of the character. Uh, he's the one that's always holding the, the book of Destiny. Is that – they use him in Sandman? Neil Gaiman took that character and added him into the dreaming as everything that he set up for the dreaming. And it made him ah. one of the major concepts uh, along with dream and death and the others. So, mm-hmm. yeah. Hmm. All See? right. I love I love that kind of uh, that that kind of stuff that that some comic creators yes mine and develop uh, from mm-hmm. that. So anyway, all these characters have have converged on the House of Mystery for Christmas. Oh, oddly enough, hmm. uh, while they wait for Santa Claus to arrive, uh, they tell each other stories to determine who is the best storyteller. Which that makes a lot of sense, uh, given especially Cain and Abel, they're always competing with each other. Uh, the witches tell of a family in a in a life raft who see a light from a distant lighthouse. Uh, but when they make it to shore, the lightkeeper tells them that the light has been out for a week. What? The daughter calls the light of the star uh, they had been following the Christmas star. Cain then, um, I believe, uh, he insults Mordred, basically saying that, that that story sucks. And then he proceeds to tell... The sad story of Mr. Podash, a pawnbroker who, quote, never missed the opportunity to out-haggle a customer. Uh, and, uh, and then uh, so he, there's a little bit where he is t- basically taking advantage of this this elderly woman who's who's trying to, to pawn some stuff so that she can afford to to buy food to make Christmas dinner. And, and he he wrings as much out of her as possible. Anyway, shortly after that, a man with a white beard appears in the store, uh, offering Podash a large diamond, which actually to me does, doesn't look all that large in in, in the story. But for, maybe for 1979, it was it was considered a, a very large diamond in exchange for everything in Mister Podash's shop. After some negotiation and some uh, quick thinking on Mister Podash's part, you know, trying to get any angle that he can. Out of this deal, uh, he reluctantly agrees, thinking his, his ship has has come in, and uh, he he can retire now with the the, the worth of whatever the whatever the worth of this diamond is, right? But then, right after the, the this man, this white bearded man, who could that who could that be, George, uh, has taken possession of the shop's contents. Podash notices that where the diamond once was in in the little case, uh, now it's a lump of coal. The white bearded man then flies away in his sleigh with all of the stuff from the shop toward a brightly shining star in the sky, intending to give back to the people their possessions that uh, Podash took from them and didn't pay nearly enough for. And he wishes Podash a Merry Christmas. Okay, so really light on the whole Christmas aspect, right? Destiny then decides, hey, I got the best story. Let me tell you. And I actually kind of like the story, even though it makes no sense whatsoever. But he tells his story about a pilot in the future, some some future world, who thought that Chris, the Christmas star was a UFO and intended to prove it, prove, prove his theory correct. So he takes this ship, the starship, and flies toward the light and uh, is pushing the, the limits of the, the engines. So as, he, as the ship exceeds the speed of light, the ship breaks apart and explodes. And uh, the explosion, as it, as, as it says in, in the story, was seen across the ages. And you see in the panel, the explosion start to transform. Uh, the light of the explosion starts to transform going back into the past, into the Christmas star seen by the three wise men. So then after Destiny is done with his story, every uh, chaos breaks loose. Everybody's hitting each other and fighting and and arguing. Uh, and then the Phantom Stranger arrives with Madame Xanadu. This is a crossover event. Right? This is great. In eight, yeah. eight pages, George. I, I was just going to say, just those three tales alone 
I, I was going to ask you, how the heck did they do that in eight pages? Now we have the Phantom Stranger and Madame Xanadu. Holy yeah. cow. I, this should have been the whole comic. Right. And so uh, this is this is where part of it kind of breaks down for me is like the Phantom Stranger. So was Phantom Stranger invited to join them? And is Madame Xanadu his plus one? Um, <laughs> or did he just, you know, because the Phantom Stranger just will appear wherever he's needed. Right. And so I think maybe that's what they were going for. Uh, because had to break the fight up. Because he arrives to remind them mm-hmm. that they have forgotten the meaning of the holiday. And to which I go, Cain and Abel know the meaning of the holiday. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, so then Abel discovers gifts in the house. They're just suddenly there. And uh, then they also then notice that the Phantom Stranger is gone. But not Madame Xanadu, because she's seen in the background of the last panel. <laughs> so, <laughs> And then uh, Mordred is asking, did somebody just hear a ho, ho, ho? <laughs> so far, that's my favorite story. I'm glad you focused on right? that one. <laughs> I, it's, like I said, I, I, had to, I had to focus on this one because I just think it's cute that those yeah. horror-adjacent hosts of, of their respective titles gather together to celebrate Christmas in their own weird way. I do find it funny that based on your description of the Batman story with the star, you said they were fighting so much to put the star in there. And this story, each tale had something to do with the star. I forgot. Did the Jonah Hex story have anything to do with oh, the star? Oh yeah. 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 Well, did I not say that? Oh, that was dumb of me. No, no, you may have, but because you didn't focus on it so much, I, the, yeah, so he, yeah, when he's when he's off to find the bad guys, you know, because he's he's oh. a bounty hunter, right? There's a yeah. there's a star in the distance that's shining that that leads him to where they are. It, and, you know, it just happenstance, but that's you know that's what that's how they. And if they I did recall it. correctly, on the cover, aren't all the characters going toward a star? Yes. All right. So this is the star. The star is the theme, basically, yeah. for the entire book. Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. See, it took me three stories to figure it out, but I'm there. <laughs> well, actually, it was really five stories when you think about it <laughs> because of all the tales right? that everybody told. Yeah. But now I get it now. I get it. <laughs> uh, so the next the next tale is a Sergeant Rock tale, The Longest Night. That's also a 10-page uh, story. Boy, those horror characters got the short end of the stick, plus it seemed like they had the most content. Exactly. Exactly. Wow. Uh, this is uh, uh, by Dick Ayers uh, and Romeo Tangle as the artist. Robert Kaniger as mm. writer, of course, Sergeant Rock. Mm-hmm. Tatiana Wood as colorist in Ben Oda. Uh, letters on this. Basically, uh, a star shows uh, Sergeant Rock and uh, Easy Company the way to their destination. Uh, they're headed for Santa Maria to rid the town of Nazis and then encounter some nuns and some Nazis. And, you know, the good guys win in the end. So then we get to the last story, which is the second one I want to focus on. This is a 12-page story. Uh, they, this is where the, the uh, pages got stolen from the horror right, characters. Right, right. Yep. Mm-hmm. And, you know, um, and given who is involved in this one, I, maybe they threw their weight around just a little bit. But this okay. is uh, this is featuring Superboy and the Legion of Superheroes. Ah. Starlight, Starbright, farthest star I see tonight. And you're not biased. At, uh, of course not. Have an extra two right? pages. Yeah, no, yeah. <laughs> um, this is by Jose Luis Garcia Lopez and Dick Giordano as artists. Wow. Paul Levitz is the writer. Adrian Roy, colorist, and Ben Oda as, does the letters on this. I just need to know, are you going to take this segment? Just this segment <laughs> and turn right it into... here into a Tales of the Legion project <laughs> podcast? <laughs> I'm sorry, George. I, I have to announce now to you and the <laughs> listeners, this is the final Christmas gab bag, and next year will be a Legion, Tales of the Legion Christmas extravaganza. <laughs> Actually, that's, uh, that, that, that might be kind of fun uh, to do if I could find enough Legion uh, Christmas stories. But okay. Okay. Yeah. I mean, especially, like I said, at, at, when I first started talking about this issue, Issues that were written or or published about the same time I was getting into comics, right? And Legion was one of those early draws for me, and so I get to read this, uh, you know, this 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 year. Or actually, it was last year when I read this to prepare for our gab bag last year that didn't happen. When I read that, it was the first time I'd read this story, and so it was a new Legion story for me. So I I I really appreciated being able to do that. 
So anyway, um, Superboy in the story arrives in the 30th century, visiting the Legion, uh, wanting an old-fashioned Christmas. Not sure why he can't just stay in uh, 20th century Smallville and have an old-fashioned Christmas with Ma and Pa Kent. But, you know, here we are. And in pursuit of that, he convinces some of the Legionnaires to go looking for the Christmas star. Uh, apparently, they didn't know about that pilot from the, the Destiny story. But when they arrive, okay, so he gets he gets uh, Phantom Girl, uh, Lightning Lad, uh, Saturn Girl, and uh, Wildfire to go along with him. And they hop in a Legion cruiser. Lightning Lad apparently is, uh, had no idea about this, but he's an ace, ace pilot and CompuNav. I don't know what. Anyway, so he he put he plugs in some numbers in the computer and off they go. But where where the star is supposed to be, there is no star. But there is a planet, a nearby planet, and uh, they they determine that uh, the planet's entering a new ice age. And the inhabitants are barely surviving right now. And so uh, with Superboy convincing them, uh, I'm not sure why they, they would need, he would need to do this, but uh, convince the Legion to help out these, these, these uh, three uh, very different races uh, on this planet. Phantom Girl notes that the United Planet's evacuation arcs wouldn't arrive in time. I'm not sure why. I mean, ice ages ice ages usually creep in over centuries, but you know, whatever. <laughs> but Superboy has he comes up with you know because Superboy is the Kirk of the Legion, right? He always comes up with a really cool plan for for surviving or or you know reaching their objective, right? So Lightning Lad and Wildfire carve out a cave. A Superboy arrives with members of each race, and. Um, uh, and he was able to do that because, you know, I, I don't know how much you know about the Legion, but they used to have telepathic earplugs so that they could communicate with each other in space. I did not know that. And I don't think even Peter mentioned that. I guess they didn't do that in the Baxter run. It's not something that they brought up yeah. very often. But mm -hmm. but he apparently used the telepathic earplugs to communicate to this these three alien races. <laughs> his, so, th his plan. Th so this was a thing. It wasn't just created for this story. Oh, no, this no, no. was a thing. No, okay. th yeah. I've, I've read about the telepathic earplugs in other stories. So Okay. So basically the plan is uh, each of the three races will use the cave as shelter and help each other until the evacuation arcs arrive. And so one race um, is growing their food to feed another race and the other races, you know, they're helping each other out to to survive this this cataclysmic event. Uh, and then later, so that, you know, they, they, the Legionnaires leave the planet. But as they're leaving, Superboy comments that Christmas is about caring and helping. And while they didn't find the star, uh, he says to them, something brought us here uh, this Christmas Eve, didn't it? Mm. And, you know, as kind of schmaltzy and uh, that sentiment is, you know, I, I, I kind of like it. <laughs> I do too. You know, friends coming together to help, uh, to help others, helping other people in in times of need. You know, that I, that says Christmas to me. You know, probably more than those other things that I talked about in this issue. <laughs> oh, oh, and um, and uh, again with the with the history lesson, George. There's a panel in here where they they reference other legionnaires and what they're doing at Christmas time. Okay. Uh, for example, um, Chameleon Boy, who is a Durlin, they don't observe Christmas because, you know, they're an alien race. Right. <laughs> and so he's just off patrolling somewhere in space. But... I thought you were going to tell me he went to a Chinese restaurant. <laughs> is that a, a Christmas story reference, George? Maybe. Okay. Maybe. <laughs> but they do show Colossal Boy, and they refer to him as uh, observing Jewish traditions during mm -hmm. the holiday. And I know Colossal Boy is Jewish based on my years of reading The Legion. But I thought, well, wait a minute. This is 1979 that this is this has come out. So was that the first time that they they uh, referenced Colossal Boy being Jewish? And oh. so, as I said, uh, history lesson, uh, it was, uh, as far as I could tell. And not only that, but it, it is one of the first times that a superhero character— 
either in DC or Marvel, uh, was explicitly identified as being Jewish. Apparently, oh. uh, it was uh, Kitty Pride in X Men just a few months earlier. So she oh. she kind of beat him out. But but I th- you know I thought that was interesting. Now I know why this is an eighty dollar comic. It's a key issue, right? For that, for that reason, yeah. Di- well, that's what's driving up all the comic prices and comic art prices. This is a key issue in terms of Legion history. Speaking of history and and ads, George, I, uh, since oh, you, please you, show you me had, the ads. You had uh, uh, talked about yours. So I love the ads. Here is an ad on the oh. inside cover for the Corgi uh, superhero cars that uh, mean great fun that fit in your pocket. Now, George, did you have any of those? No. Okay, let me see no. that ad again. No, I I saw this ad so much in a lot of the comics that I read at that time and i could swear i had that joker really i believe so i so wanted the supermobile yeah hold that up again <laughs> i know th- this is very good radio right I, uh, <laughs> very good podcast i could swear i had the batmobile the bat copter and that joker mobile i don't think i had any of the other things but they look so familiar I well, they look familiar to me only because of the ad because I saw it so much. But I really wanted those. Another one in here, uh, I was going to ask you, and I saw this is another ad that I saw so many times, so many okay. times in comics, and it's the um, the sea monkeys. Sea monkeys. <laughs> Did you ever? No. no. I always wondered what they really. Were. Yeah. 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 When I was a kid, I was like, "What is this?" <laughs> I actually, uh, uh, just a few years ago, I finally broke down and looked at, you know, did did a Google search to see if there are any images or videos of people who had, who had actually ordered these things. And yes, they, right there, there is another another question of mine: who orders these things? So yeah, so I got to see that, and it's not as as fun as the ad would yeah. make you think. Final final thing here, I I, I mentioned it earlier. Here's the Daily Planet entry. At the very, oh, yes. uh, or the the back of the the issue, we got um, the direct currents uh, for things that are on sale the week of December seventeenth, which includes House of Mystery two seventy eight, Legion of Superheroes two sixty one, Sergeant Rock three thirty eight. So kind of on brand, on point for, and there's a couple other ones, but but if in terms of the characters that are in here, uh, the Hembeck uh, strip here has Lois and Jimmy. Lois is saying, where's Perry? Jimmy, he quit the planet and ran off to Las Vegas to become a stand-up comedian. Lois, great Caesar's Palace. Jimmy, mm-hmm. I'll say. <laughs> that almost goes along with the outcome. I was going to say, uh, about the same <laughs> level of humor there, I think. What What was the headline? The headline said something about Scalp Hunter. Scalp Hunter oh, flees we... rebels. Yeah, this is in wow. weird Western tales. Yeah, putting Scalp Hunter right there at the top of direct currents. Yeah. yeah. And, and then there's a... Um, uh, ask the ask the answer man. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'll just uh, a couple of these. Why not revive Plop? Asks oh, Holden. Plop. Did you ever read Plop? Uh, I I think I've looked at a few issues of you know mm-hmm. a very long time ago. I picked a couple of those off the rack. I meant to look this up because uh, Bob a- answers it with there are no plans for the near future, but maybe someday. I'm, and I was I was kind of wondering, did they ever revive Plop? I kind of think not. Mm. No, he was probably just trying to appease the guy. There are a lot of questions. There's, I don't know, three or four about how much is, you know, X comic worth? Oh. One of the questions that's asked is, what is the most valuable comic in your personal collection? Oh. And Bob says, I guess Fantastic Four number one. I hate that guy. Which I bought in 1961 for 10 cents and now catalogs, and this is 1979, for $900. (laughs) <laughs> bargain at any I, price. I man. think it's worth a lot more than that, George. I do too. Especially <laughs> in these uh, semi-post-COVID times. All right. What is up next for your Christmas comics? All right. Well, Supersized Alf Holiday Special was a very serious comic. I think we can all agree on that. It was a Marvel comic. And last year I did one Marvel, one DC, and one independent, kind of almost like in the geek speak old style. So, having a Marvel comic, now I've decided to throw in a DC comic. Hot Wheels number six. <laughs> Hot Wheels only ran six issues. So, this is the 
sixth and final issue of the series. Hot Wheels being the toy cars that we would play with as kids, Matchbox, I guess, being their biggest rival. Mm -hmm. Although Cor Corgi had those great superhero <laughs> cars that were in that ad that you were talking about. This is dated, cover dated January, February 1971 with a cover price of 15 cents. It hit the stands. I did do a little research on this one. It hit the stands on November 17th, 1970. Now, actually, just to remind you that that ALF comic came out in 1990, well, winter 1990. So I, I guess it came out in 89, around the holidays, 1989. The cover is done by Neil Adams, the late, great Neil Adams. Mm, I was wondering about that. And it depicts one of the Hot Wheel characters helping a girl uh, you can see her her legs in a splint. There's like a f first aid kit that's like half half on the page, half off the page, and a maniacal Santa Claus is in in a like a Hot Wheels car that that doubles as a sleigh because it's got those I don't mm. know what you call the things on the end of, of of a sleigh that let it slide through the snow, and it looks like he's coming to attack them. Now, when I first saw this cover, though. I guess I didn't see the splint and the first aid kit. And I thought that Santa was interrupting a romantic rendezvous <laughs> on, on the snow covered peak. I don't know where my, my mind's going there, but if you look at it, you, you can't deny that it doesn't look like there's some hanky panky going on, on this cover. Here. Well, you know, especially where the guy's hand is hovering over or near. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. But then I see the splint on her leg and, and the first aid kit. I'm like, okay, he's trying to help her out. But really, I mean, Neil Adams did put a little bit of an entendre in there, I think. <laughs> All right, so now I'm going to go to my ever-present notes that I don't stick to. So I'm going to throw the names at you. Jack Whelan, Kip Clark, Tank Mallory, Mickey Barnes, Janet, and Ardeth. These are the characters in Hot Wheels comics. Okay. Now, if there was an X-Men comic, you would already know. Colossus, Cyclops, Wolverine. But here I feel it's necessary for me to at least tell you who the characters are, because again, only ran six issues. This is the sixth and final issue we're going to talk about here. And it's over 50 years old. <laughs> Some people don't even realize there, there was a Hot Wheels comic. All right, so here we go. Into the book. There are two stories in here, and again, much to how I, I guess I pick comics. The first story is Christmas theme. The second th story is not. So we're going to focus on the first story. The spirit of Christmas sifts softly through the air, filling everyone it touches with a feeling of brotherhood and charity that sadly is only felt this once each year. Yada, 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 yada. I heard there, there's a lot of text here, just like in your book. But I love this. I could read just the captions and, and I'd be having a lot of fun. <laughs> but well, George, who, who wrote this? Oh, I, I was getting to that. This is a Len Wein written ah, production. Ah, I, I, with, I, I, sorry, I did not mention this, but in my mm -hmm. my DC special, ah. all those stories uh, were edited by Len Wein. Oh, ah, okay. See all the connections. There. Yes. And you know something? You're making me want to dig that out. Uh, my, my collection is not anywhere near as organized as yours or Peter or most of the people who listen to your show. Uh, it, that issue is somewhere in this house. It'd probably be easier for me to just go buy it for $80, which I'm not going to do, <laughs> but then me try to find it in this house. And I know that was one of Peter's uh, on, on his uh, show, The Daily Rios. If nobody listens, I don't know why you're not listening. Uh, he did mention something about organizing your collection being a New Year's resolution or something like that. Yeah. And here we are, 2023 is coming in. I haven't done, you know, diddly squat on that. Anyway, so sorry, Peter, if you're listening. This town of Maiden Valley doesn't specify the state. Around Christmas time, they invite all these kids from an orphanage to come and bask in the glow of their ski village, take advantage of the slopes and the spas. And it's just a week for the orphans to have some fun and forget about their troubles. In addition to that, there is what is called a gymkhana, which I had no idea what that was, and I had to look it up. And it's really just a motorsport race, basically trying to see who is the fastest on the court. And it's spelled Jim, like going to the gymnasium, G-Y-M, 
Khanna, K-H-A-N-A. I never heard the term before. I don't know anything about mo- motorsports, but apparently it is a type of motorsport. Hmm. And they use the they use the term once or twice in this book. Our heroes, Jack and Kip, are driving on a course on the ice. And they are well ahead of the uh, competition. But of course, a dog named Stinky has to run out on the course, making them veer off, hitting a bit of a divot in the ice, causing them to go butt over tea kettle and crash on the ice. And this is where uh, we get a little bit of the great pros as the car is skidding and and going into a, a turn. Images blur and spin before Jack's eyes. And the only sound that he can hear through the pounding is the roar and the thunder of Hot Wheels with the Hot Wheels logo (laughs) in the Humbug Run, a midnight visitation by Dick Giordano, the ghost of Christmas past, Len Wein, the ghost of Christmas present, Neil Adams, the ghost of Christmas yet to be, dunk, 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 Dick Giordano did the inks. And and he was the editor. So this is a Neil Adams drawn comic. Their car is destroyed. And because their car is destroyed, they can't go home for Christmas. So they're going to be stuck in this town for the holidays. So they try to make the most of it and they go skiing. I will say that the characters do look like they're drawn by Neil Adams. Although Jack Wheeler looks like he could be a double for Johnny Quest sometimes. Oh, that I'm sorry. When you show me the cover. Uh huh. That's who I was thinking of. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. Really? Johnny Quest. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. So some of the profile shots or three quarter shots, he he looks like it could be Johnny Quest, like an, an older Johnny Quest. But the character of Tank is more exaggerated and more cartoony. He's got the really like uh, the tick type of jawline, oh, okay. where, where the jaw is extended, uh, overly extended, and he's got the big big muscles you could picture it in a cartoon and in fact i think there was a hot wheels cartoon oh i'm and sure i'm guessing this is this is where all the characters come from but tank in particular looks like he comes straight out of a saturday morning cartoon mm-hmm. in this book whereas the other ones have more of a neil adamish uh adams ish uh look to them as they're skiing down the mountain there's a little kid who's frozen in place like a deer in the headlights as, as an avalanche is coming down the mountain so Jack Wheeler, our hero, goes to save the kid and, of course, gets him in the nick of time. But the kid is like an insolent brat, doesn't really appreciate that that he was saved from an, uh, from an avalanche. And he says, get get your hands off me, you, you pig. You, you know, I'm out of here. And the other guys are like, whoa, talk about an ingrate. What the heck is that all about? So, P.S., you go to the next day, fast forward to the next day, and the guys are fixing their car and the kid runs across the parking lot to them and asks for their help. He's frantic. And he's saying, I'm being pursued by people with guns. They're, they're, they're after me. And, and nobody believes this kid. They're like, what do you, you know, first of all, you're an, you're, you're an ungrateful little pig and you're, you're asking us for help. We don't believe you. Why would people be chasing you with guns? And then sure enough, bullets start flying. So they take cover behind these oil cans and, and stuff. And, and who's shooting at them? henchmen dressed as elves and you could tell they're henchmen by the way neil adams draws them like oh we're a bunch of mugs kind of thing and of course tank being the big brutish guy he throws the the i don't know what you call those cans they look like gas cans but you know they're not filled with gas cans you you, you see those uh you see them all over racetracks on the side of, of a racetrack but picture like almost like a beer keg type of thing So Tank starts throwing them at the elves, and of course the elves get hit with them. The guys jump in the car with the kid and are being pursued by the elves who are shooting at them. And our Hot Wheels drivers are, of course, experts at what they do because they're Hot Wheels guys. There's a snow blower that's cleaning up the road in front of them, and Jack drives the car really quickly past the snowblower, just missing being hit by the snow that's being dumped. But of course, the elves that are following them aren't so lucky, and their convertible car, they get covered in snow, and that's how the guys get get rid of them. 
or or at least slow them down so that they don't catch up. Now I see you thinking, have you have have you been in a situation like this before, Eric? <laughs> I just, no, because I wouldn't drive a convertible with a top <laughs> down where there's snow. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, how else are you going to shoot everybody? <laughs> well, I guess you know, I wouldn't be shooting anybody. So <laughs> yeah, I guess yeah, I guess not. Yeah, <laughs> there is a th- there was a pop culture reference here that. Uh, actually, you, you may have known because considering when the, when this was printed, but I, I had to look this up. When they're skiing down the slopes before they first meet the little kid, Tank is having trouble keeping steady on the skis, and uh, one of their other buddies, Mickey, says, "That's our Tank, the Jean Claude Keeley of the Fender Bender set." Now, Jean Claude Keeley is an Alpine French Alpine skier. Mm-hmm. Olympic medalist, I think he won all the Alpine events in the 68 Olympics, which would make sense ah. because this is a comic that came out in 1970. And at the time, the Winter Olympics and the Summer Olympics both occurred in the same year before they they alternated in two-year shifts in the 90s. So in 68, there would have been the Winter and the Summer Olympics. So in 1970, Jean-Claude Keeley was probably still in the cultural zeitgeist. In fact, some kids who probably watched the Olympics knew who that was. So I thought that that was a very interesting reference that wouldn't carry today. Considering, <laughs> I mean, I talk about references when they're being chased by the elves and the elves get hit with all the snow as they're clearing the car and still in pursuit of our Hot Wheels heroes. One of the guys in the car says, how are we doing, Hot Shot? And the other person answers, rotten. That fruitcake Farkle family is still on our tail. Now, do you get the Farkle family reference? I don't. The Farkle family are, uh, and this is what I think they are. I can't think of any other reference. It would be Frank and Fanny Farkle of Laughing. Oh, <laughs> they, they had the Goldie Hawn reference mm-hmm. uh, in a 1990, 1989 comic. Here, a little more current for the time. Yeah. That you make a Farkle family reference. Anne Rowan was Frank Farkle. I think Joanne Worley was Fanny Farkle. Maybe that changed over time. I don't think Joanne Worley was always Fanny Farkle. But anyway, it, it was the Farkle family, and because their name was a tongue twister, if I recall correctly, most of a sketch with that family was just a bunch of tongue twisters and trying to match up the name Farkle, like Sparkle Farkle, Arkle Farkle, you know, just crazy things. Like It was really more a wordplay sketch than anything else. When it happened, but I thought that was interesting to throw the Farkle family in in the middle of a Hot Wheels comic. Turns out that the boy is a prince of some, I don't know, what, what do they call it? Calvania. I don't think Calvania is a real country, or it def- wasn't a real country back then. And his father is on his deathbed. The son escaped from his chaperone, made his way to hide out in an orphanage. And it turns out that that orphanage was the one that went to this town for the uh, the festivities for the holidays. And he has always been pursued by these people, and they're probably just dressed as elves to blend in with the holiday themes that are going on in the town. Turns out their big boss finds them, and he's dressed as Santa Claus. Of course. So Santa Claus comes in, guns, toting his guns with the four goons dressed as elves that were chasing them down before. The fight ensues. You can almost hear, uh, think of almost like, I guess, maybe the monkeys when the monkeys would get into a bind. And then there'd be that little montage with the monkeys music playing in the background. And then there'd be the fight with the bad guys or whatever. (laughs) I, I, I kind of was thinking that as the caption box was, ex, you know, was kind of explaining uh, all the action that was taking place with no dialogue going on. As the Hot Wheels guys were beating up the elves in Santa Claus. Turns out that after they subdue Santa and the elves, they find out that they Santa couldn't have shot them even if he wanted to because some kid put bubble gum in, in the gut. Ha 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 ha. So, disaster averted. The boy is with the uh, the Hot Wheels gang. They're going to send him back. Turns out his father is is going to make a full recovery. The whole thing was Santa Claus was his uncle, and because the king was 
on his deathbed. He thought the king was going to die. The only heir was the kid. If he killed the kid, he would take the throne. So that's what this was all about. He escapes and, I mean, the kid escapes. He's going to go back home. His father's fine. The kid's a little upset because now he wants to hang out with the Hot Wheels gang, but they're like, you have to go back, but don't worry, we won't forget about you. Maybe there was an intention if this series went on to go back and meet the kid and be in his country. But lo and behold, the other cast members come to them so they're not spending Christmas alone. It's Janet and Ardeth, the two people I mentioned before, Jack Wheeler's dad, and the commissioner. There's always a commissioner. And they say, uh, uh, we, we couldn't let you spend Christmas alone. We're going to spend Christmas together. And um, at the end, in the little caption box with Holly around it, it says, what more can we add? Season's greetings to all men everywhere and above all peace. All men everywhere mm -hmm. and above all peace. So that's the first story. Then there's a pinup, kind of like a pinup page with, um, it's like a stock car. It, the K3 magnet. And then it tells you the history of the magnet and how somebody who drove it and won races with it. So it's, it's like a pinup page. There was a, a follow-up story with called super chick where there's a race and their, their Dick Dastardly character called uh, Dexter Carter was going up against the hot wheels gang. And what as um, the hot wheels gang were, taking a break after the practice and, and what the race was, is it was a race on motorcycles with sidecars. So you had to have two people in the race, the motorcycle driver and the person in the sidecar. And the, the purpose of that was they were going so fast, the person in the sidecar would have to shift their body weight in order to prevent mm -hmm. the motorcycle from uh, tumbling over based on the speeds they were taking turns. Dexter Carter has some of his goons and typical goons going, duh, and yeah, sure, boss, we'll, we'll get them for you. <laughs> they, they kidnap Kip, who's going to be in the sidecar. And they're roughing him up, but Kip is a kind of like a Zen karate guy. So he gets away from them uh, with a black eye, and he, uh, he beat them up using his kung fu moves. But in the meantime, while he was doing that, one of the girls, Ardith, not knowing much about the Hot Wheels comic or the Hot Wheels gang, it seems like Ardith knows a lot about cars, but because she's a girl, she's looked down upon by the guys. So she says she'll fill in for Kip, be in the sidecar. So, of course, Mickey driving the, driving the motorcycle is like, oh, okay, you're just a girl. You know, you can't do that. Oh, okay, I'm, I'm stuck. I can't do anything else. And she does it, and oh, her, her friend is telling her, you know, you've got to be a little more feminine than, than, I mean, she basically says that. That's all wrong, Ardeth. You've got to be helpless and feminine if you want Mickey to dig you. Oh, God. Mm -hmm. And and she, she helped him uh, with a clogged uh, carburetor or something like that. So she knows her way around cars, but she has to pretend she doesn't because she's a girl. Mm -hmm. At least they were giving her some knowledge and and experience and not just not just wanting to 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 be the girlfriend of one of the other characters right and she knew what to do she she knew how to yeah shift her body weight to to do exactly what kip was supposed to do <laughs> and in the end she uh she uh saves the day because dexter carter is just like dick dastardly in the in the uh the laugh olympics Mm -hmm. always he's always cheating so they get ahead of the hot wheels gang and they're trying their best to catch up but they they're falling behind and is there they're getting really close artith does something that makes the uh she makes some funny faces to make the the, the dumb henchman in in the sidecar laugh and because he's laughing so hard he doesn't do the shifting with his body which causes them to lose time and the Hot Wheels gang cross the finish line first. And of course, that gets Mickey, the Hot Wheels guy's attention that, hey, you know, you're not so bad after all, artist. Mm -hmm. You know, you know your way around a car, uh, a car and a motorcycle. Kudos for you. In fact, um, it's that 
thing that makes him say to her, Ardeth, you're beautiful. You turn me on. And the other girl's like, oh, I give up. I don't know how to, you know, I don't know a way, the way to this guy's heart. I, I, you know, I can't give Ardeth uh, guy advice anymore. Now, there was a direct current in here, and it's an old school direct current where there's text for all the comics that are coming out. I, I'm, I'm showing Eric the page here. I'm not going to read any of this stuff. But instead of just giving a little blurb for each of the comics that were coming out at the time, I mean, what that, that's a nice paragraph for each of those. You see yeah. those, right? Yeah. 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 So that's um, that, that's good stuff. But the I, I'm not even really going to talk about the ads here, although there was an ad for a Snoopy Sopwith Camel. Oh, really? Model. Yeah. Yeah. Right there on the front cover. Huh. But but there there's a two page ad for Superman. And there's a, and I'm guessing, I'm guessing it's Kurt Swan. I'm not sure. Yeah, it looks like Kurt Swan artwork. So there's a, there's a pinup page that says a new year brings a new beginning for Superman. And there's a, uh, yeah, a pinup of Superman. And then there are some panels showing Superman advancing through the ages. Uh, like first he, 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 he really just jumped an eighth of a mile before he flew his his power set was different, right? And then it, it showed the um, how kryptonite has changed. Like it went from green kryptonite to uh, a strange experiment has changed all green K on Earth to harmless iron, but it also created a new weakness, the exact nature of which even Superman doesn't know. But you can see what it is in the January issue of Superman, and I don't know what that was. Hmm. This was Clark Kent when he originally started working for George Taylor, editor of the Daily Star. Time passed, and now Clark was working for Perry White, editor of the Daily Planet. This is Clark Kent, 1971, working for Morgan Edge, president of the Galaxy Broadcasting System. Now, I got to admit, I didn't know that that happened so early. I didn't know that that was a, a 1971 like yeah. early 70s yeah, change. I, I thought that was a, a 1980s thing. Yeah, so it was as early as that. Huh. But what this ad is doing after giving those little tidbits of Superman's history, you know, very, very brief things that I guess they wanted to call attention to, like the kryptonite thing changing and how now Superman works for, how Clark Kent works for a TV station as opposed to a newspaper. The last four or five panels are there are other changes in the Superman family of magazines. Jimmy Olsen and the new Newsboy Legion, written and drawn by Jack Kirby. Rose and the Thorn, a new feature appearing in Lois Lane. Supergirl, a whole new look for the Maid of Might in an adventure comics. Superman teams up with The Flash, Robin, Green Lantern, and others in World's Finest. Also, new Superman features in the current issues of Action Comics. The Legion of Superheroes and Superboy. Untold Tales of Krypton and Superman. So this was a two-page ad letting you know that Superman was supposed to be the thing to watch in 1971. So it was pretty cool. Not to mention, you know, Superman was, was you know, like Batman is today. Yeah. And so uh, it pleases me greatly to, he to, to hear you describe this for, you know, what was it, 1971? Right, exactly. This, this, new, this, new this year. book came out, yeah. Well, well, it came out in 1970. Oh, okay. And th this was promoting the brand new year, 1971. It, it was going to be big for Superman. Yeah. Power. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Cool. Yeah, so that was a lot of fun. Uh, Hot Wheels. I never uh, read any other issue of Hot Wheels before. Uh, this one I picked up specifically because it was Christmas. It had a Christmas cover. Yeah. It's the, the only reason I even bought it. Wait, did you get it specifically for our our, dis our Christmas discussion, or was it something you picked up before that? Perhaps. No, I, I only just bought it this year. Oh, really? Okay. I specifically bought it for our discussion. I, I, I wasn't lying when I said I start thinking about it. It's like the thing, Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade. The parade <laughs> ends, they have their Thanksgiving dinner, and they start planning the next one. Mm -hmm. I gave myself the week between Christmas and New Year's off, but then once <laughs> January 1st came on, I was already thinking about our Christmas gambit. Very nice. Okay. One of my favorite holiday traditions. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, I don't know if this is uh, tradition worthy, George. My next uh, uh, focus, uh, the character, the book. This is a special one shot that came out uh, December 22nd, 2010. 
And this is by uh, Brett Booth, Jeff Johns, which might give you a clue as to what this oh. is. Andrew Dollhouse, uh, Nick J. Napolitano. And uh, with a Gene Haw cover, this is the Green Lantern Larflee's Christmas special. Ah, uh, yes. So I was... Uh, I mentioned Emerald City Comic Con earlier for the the first comic. I was at Emerald City Comic Con. I think the first one that I went to was in 2010. And so that would have been March. And this comic came out in December. And I was at the DC panel. And I remember Jeff Johns specifically talking about or or first uh, mentioning, because that's, you know, there were there was a time in which major announcements came out. At Seattle, uh, the Emerald City Comic Con, uh, before things shifted and they started moving them to other <laughs> other venues. But uh, so Jeff Johns talked about the Larflee's Christmas special. And I still remember the somewhat raucous and agreeable laughter in the room by uh, the attendees. It's like Larflee's Christmas special. What does that mean? What is that all about? Right. <laughs> And I, you know, I was a huge fan of uh, the, the Green Lantern run during that time. You know, Jeff Johns was was piloting that, uh, and we got you know great stories coming out of that, including Blackest Night. But here we have the the Larflee's Christmas special, titled "Orange You Glad It's Christmas." Aren't you glad I didn't say Larflee's? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and and just like uh, with the uh, DC super, uh, uh, special series. I have this epigraph here uh, to share. Some questionable, questionable readers may tell you that Christmas has become nothing but a crass, commercialized, capitalist concoction. Love it. More alliteration. I love it. Yeah. And to that, I argue inver invariably every holiday season. But perhaps what Christmas needs is a fresh pair of eyes to sense the magic of this winter festival. So let's take a trip through the holiday season with a creature of unquestionable avarice. Traveling from far across the universe to Earth, the Orange Lantern, known as Larflees, has discovered the existence of a powerful being who bestows gifts to everyone on December 25th. Making Earth his new home, Larflees eagerly has counted down the moments to Christmas morning, when he'll get all he's put on his list from the all-powerful and all-seeing guardian known as Santa Claus. So that's the setup. <laughs> 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 basically uh the story is he wakes up christmas day to discover that uh, he has no gifts that he's requested from santa claus so they must be stolen oh, no. they must be stolen mm -hmm. right so he he's investigating uh he determines in his brilliantly deductive way that it's santa, larfley's way it's larfley's <laughs> way that santa claus has reneged on on their compact oh. i.e i write things on a list you give them to me uh, and so um, he happens to see Santa Claus uh, on a Christmas Day parade on the television and, of course, heads off to confront the elf. When he finds that first Santa in the parade isn't the real Santa, he sees another one and chases that one into a, build, uh, into a building and discovers many of them because they're all area Santa Clauses or you know, part of the parade or whatever. And, you know, he's he's quite confused and demanding to know where's the where's the real Santa Claus? Uh, a kid. I don't know why this kid's around, but he is uh, <laughs> tells him that the real Santa lives in the North Pole and away he mm. goes. Of course, he doesn't he doesn't find Santa in the North Pole, you know, because Santa's magic and and mm. can hide from weird Larfleys alien and, Larfleys, yeah. is, right? Mm -hmm. Right, kids. But Green Lantern, Hal Jordan, arrives to explain the Christmas spirit to Larflees. Oh. To better illustrate this point, Green Lantern takes Larflees' uh, uh, hoard, his his accumulated stuff. Uh, you know, because that's that's what he, that's his thing. He takes you know takes and takes and takes and takes, and redistributes what he can to the children. Not in the North Pole; they're now somewhere else, of course. <laughs> Larfley still doesn't understand the Christmas spirit and why would you give back the stuff that I have? What? What? But so Green Lantern tells him, look at your Christmas list and ask yourself, do I really need it? And then flies away in a huff because Larfley just isn't getting it. 
<laughs> However, the issue ends with uh, Larflee's reviewing the list, stopping on one entry. And it's underlined, I think it's near the bottom of his list, and it simply says, my family. Mm. And so in case you don't know, <laughs> which I, I don't know, I, I actually didn't know the history of Larflee's either. He was uh, he was taken from his family when he was younger and enslaved. I don't know by whom, but is, is that part of the book though? Like, do they say this? In the no, book? not not in this. It's in, it was okay. in other mm-hmm. other uh, stories. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you know, before becoming Agent Orange, you know, uh, the the, mm-hmm. the Orange Lantern. One of uh, Larflee's companions. So you know how all of the other colored lanterns are comprised of all these different people, right? Or 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 aliens or whatever, right? Yeah, Larflee's is the only. Orange Lantern, because you can only have one. Because if there's mm-hmm. others, you have to share. Mm-hmm. Larflees doesn't share. But what he does is he creates orange light constructs. And one of those is named Glomulus. And so mm-hmm. he, Glomulus is a frequent companion of Larflees. And uh, he actually appears in the story early on, but Larflees basically tells him to go away or whatever. You know, mm-hmm. shoes him off. Well, come to find out at the very end of this of the of the this this uh, issue, we get uh, a wonderful uh, just a few pages, uh, yeah, just two pages done by um, Art Baltazar and Franco. If you're familiar oh, yeah. with their work, sure. Uh, they did uh, Tiny Titans and uh, yeah. some other things that I'm for- forgetting at the moment. The one piece of artwork I bought this year is a Franco Dazzler. Oh, really? Oh, mm-hmm. wow. Yeah. You have mm-hmm. to show me that. Did you post that on, on your social media? I think I did, but I would gladly show I'll, I'll have to. Yeah. I'll have to look that up. Anyway. Yeah. So what we get to hear is uh, uh, the story, where did Glomulus go? And it's like I said, it's a two-page thing. It's more or less a gag. He goes to the various other Lantern Corps mm. uh, searching for something orange, you know, to give to Larflees. Yeah. He goes to Sinestro doesn't you know Sinestro doesn't have anything orange and tries to scare him because that's what the yellow lanterns are all about fear anyway Mm -hmm. uh he gets he gets annoyed with glomulus and to shoo him away he's like give him give him uh give him some candy butterscotch i don't like those so he's got a he's got an orange candy right Uh he goes to uh the blue lanterns and steals a bluebird of hopefulness and everybody's like i hope he treats him well (laughs) <laughs> goes to the uh uh i think it's pronounced yismalt or ismalt uh the red lantern planet oh boy and uh what's his uh, i've forgotten his name whoever the red lantern is <laughs> and um doesn't have anything orange but uh he, he does give glomulus a fruit cake oh, with, with okay. orange in it there you go mm-hmm. goes to zamoran with the uh the, the star sapphires and uh they're all loving each other and expressing their love for each other, and that manifests its, the, itself as as uh, sapphire hearts, purple hearts, right? So he grabs one of those and takes it. And then he goes to um, the indigo uh, lanterns, and apparently they have an indigo girls, spelled G-U-R-L-Z, uh, C-D, indigo girls. <laughs> so he takes that. <laughs> And then brings all that stuff back to uh, to Larflees. So I I just thought that was cute. And okay, you think that, that's that's a pretty good uh, Christmas issue, right? One shot, yeah. not mm-hmm. too long of a story. You got that nice little thing at the end, like I just described. No, no, George, there's there's there's, there's more here. Oh, okay, there's more. There is a uh, it, there's there there are three items in here interspersed throughout the story. Uh, one is the Larflees' Orange Lantern Cookies. It's a recipe, George. Oh, no way. A real recipe. An actual recipe. I've not made it. I've I've been meaning to do that for like the last year or so to to see if they actually work. But I'm not a big fan of orange-flavored things, so. Mm. Well, you know who could make that real, really well, I'll bet you. Huh. A uh, friend of both our shows, Greg, uh, artist, writer, Greg oh. Sheagle. Oh, of mm-hmm. course. He, he's he's the bacon champion. Okay, uh, when it comes to the comic book world, I'm gonna have to send this to him and and ask him yes. if he's ever done this. I will say another reason why I, I don't want to make this, although I could obviously <laughs> cut the recipe in half. But it says at the bottom makes approximately two dozen cookies or one serving if you're Larflees. <laughs> but by the way, when Glomulus Glomulus is his mm-hmm. name, right? When Glomulus brought, do we see him actually giving all those? 
yes. gifts to Lawfleys. And yes. what does Lawfleys do? Oh, sorry. I should have. I should have said. Uh, does go. he appreciate it? I don't know what's in his. Uh... He, he, sa- he says, Glam, look at all the stuff you got me. Oh, he talks about. Oh, oh, the blue bird of hopefulness. Glomulus <laughs> painted it orange. Oh, okay. I was going to say, how, how does that fit into orange? But okay. Yeah. So everything, not everything is orange, but for some reason he painted the blue bird orange. So he says, mm-hmm. but this orange bird is awesome and the paint, the paint's still wet. Thanks, Galam. Oh, good. Okay. Yeah. So you appreciate it. He did. He did. Yeah. <laughs> so, may, so maybe he actually did learn something from, yes. Green, from Green Lantern. His heart grew three sizes that day. <laughs> The one of the other things in here is a help Larflees get to the North Pole, and it's Was one it of maze? those. It's one of those mazes. Oh, I love I love puzzle pages. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. It's got um, a Yeti chasing him at one point. Oh, he sees the he he encounters Superman's Fortress of Solitude, uh. Uh, chased again by uh, the White Bears. They're called polar bears. Polar bears. Thank you. No problem. Oh, he's also chased by, uh, apparently he went to the wrong pole. Oh, yeah, he went to the <laughs> South Pole by accident and is chased by penguins. Okay. Anyway. And then finally, the other, the final gag page thingy. Oh, yes. Is you, if you cut out this from the page, you can make your own Larfley's Christmas ornament. That's something that might be worth color uh, photocopying on a color copy. Uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah, it, uh-huh. and it, what's what, what's kind of funny about this is that so this is a triangular shape that you then fold into uh, a mm. pyramid design. Yeah. Well, there are tabs on here where you would you would attach glue to to you know put it all together, and mm. the tabs actually say, "I want glue." I want glue. <laughs> yeah. Larflees can be pretty one note in in the regular mm-hmm. stories. Um, I found this this uh, whole issue quite charming <laughs> for for all these reasons. All the all these all the entries in here that we have for uh, for this this uh, one shot. So I, I quite enjoyed that one. Yeah, yeah, that, that was a fun one, and it's it's such a novelty. And like and like you said that the crowd the crowd reaction at at the panel Larflees Christmas what yeah. And here, here it sounds like it was a really good issue. Before I get on to my third book, I think I should just let you know I was remiss. I didn't tell you who the creative team was for that second story in the Hot Wheels comic. I was going to ask you about that. Yeah. Well, A, there are no credits <laughs> for that. So I looked it up on the DC fandom site to see if it would say anything. And the only thing it said was uh, who the artist was. And the artist was Rick Estrada. Oh, okay. Uh, from from Super Friends fame. Mm-hmm. From what I saw, he also did work. He was a consultant for the He-Man and the Masters of the Universe cartoon, among other comics that he had worked on. So anyway, I wanted to at least give that little credit there. It's the only one. I don't know why. I guess DC didn't keep good records back then. So even on DC fandom, they they don't they don't have that. Okay, I forget which year you did a uh, you 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 brought a an illustrated classics Mm -hmm. to the table and it was a Christmas Carol. I think that was 2020. Oh, okay. The the last time we were together for, for, for this purpose, the, and I don't know, maybe some other comics that we've discussed have been homages to a Christmas Carol. Cause let's face it, who, who doesn't try to do a Christmas Carol, right? That's right. Well, I have a comic here from a company called airwave comics. It came out in going back to my notes here. All my notes in here, you hear folks. I actually took notes that I don't read. It came out in 2003, but it is the comic book adaptation of a Christmas special from 1962. So I find it very weird that in 2003, this company called Airwave Comics put out the comic book adaptation of. The 1962 classic, Mr. Magoo's Christmas Carol. Okay. Even today, especially with the way streaming is and the rights of things, do you think anybody under the age of 30 knows who Mr. Magoo even is? No. I don't either. Yeah. And in 2003, it might have been questionable because this special, as the 2000s rolled on, as far as I know, I didn't see this in syndication around the holidays, even 20 years ago, the way I used to see it when I was a kid or when I was in my 20s or even my 30s. 
But this is the comic book version of A Christmas Carol. And if anybody has seen the special, uh, Mr. Magoo plays Ebenezer Scrooge. I don't think any particular characters from his cartoon show played any of the other characters. I think they just created a Bob Cratchit, a Tiny Tim, and then, of course, the ghosts of Christmas past, present, and yet to be. And uh, Jacob Marley, of course. And, you know, speaking of Greg Shegel before, Greg used to do a lot of work for SpongeBob comics and for SpongeBob merchandise. And you couldn't necessarily tell the difference between anything Greg did and what the cartoon looked like. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. when, when you have some of these licensed things, you really do have to adhere to the model sheets. So Greg could appreciate that. I mean, this is basically taken from the cells. <laughs> it, it wasn't, but I mean, whoever drew this, and again, there, there are really no credits here, but I mean, it looks like a Mr. Magoo cartoon. And I mean, we all know the story of, of A Christmas Carol, so I'm not going to go through it, but again, Mr. Magoo plays Scrooge, and one of the things, uh, one of the parts of the special that has been left out is Scrooge's interactions with his nephew. His nephew doesn't appear in the comic at all. So that whole bit is is out that he meets his nephew then he goes to eat with the nephew uh but everything else is in there he gets visited by the ghosts in my head i can hear some of the songs that sh where they should be in the special while i was reading the comic what one of my favorite lines that i still say to this day even in the middle of july i'll go and razzle berry dressing which <laughs> <laughs> don't ask me why but they didn't have a razzleberry dressing line in here because it, that was I don't think that was part of a Christmas carol. I think that that was just part of a song that they put into the show that uh, Tiny Tiny Tim sing, sings that line. But in doing some of my research, because I was a little curious about this, I was like, Airwave Comics, I'm really not very familiar with them. When I looked this up, I found another Mr. Magoo Christmas Carol compilation from Airwave Comics. And the, it, it went for, it looks like it's a trade paperback as opposed to being a comic. And by the way, this comic from 2003 was cover priced $4.95. Apparently, there is a bigger compilation of this with deleted scenes, which makes me wonder, do they throw in the nephew? I'm trying to think of what deleted scenes are in there. So I'm guessing maybe they added the part with his interactions with his nephew. And maybe they expanded on some of the interactions with the ghosts because he it's a very short comic i mean the interaction in the past and the in the present especially could have had a little more meat on it. but you know you only have so many pages in a, in a comic book so they had to leave some stuff out so i find it very interesting that there's another version of this out there by the same company with quote deleted scenes and, and i think some other things in there maybe some essays or whatever I'd be very interested in finding that. I mean, I could probably purchase it on the internet, but I'd rather seek it out in the wild. Yeah. If I ever see it, you know, I'll, I'll, it's one of those things I'll pick up. Uh, another thing about Airwave Comics, some of the titles I didn't recognize, uh, but Alan Moore did some work for them. But what I found really, really interesting is another TV show that they adapted to comics. I don't know for how many issues. But they did I Dream of Genie. And again, for something to come out in the early 2000s, I Dream of Genie. Right. It's fun to have that license. But again, I'm trying to think they definitely be marketing to us. I can't imagine a 16 year old or 12 year old, although I Dream of Genie, maybe you don't no. need to know it as long as you know that it's a genie. <laughs> the, the master doesn't want the genie to use her powers or whatever. And I don't know. He's an astronaut. I mean, maybe it's just fun. You don't have to know the TV show. But I found that, that that was a very interesting other licensing thing that this company had at that time. Oh, and they left out the, you know, the speech in A Christmas Carol. I forget the exact words, but basically the holidays are just uh, another reason to pick, pick your pocket. Mm -hmm. pick, um, that speech was totally left out of this. But I mean, I know it's in the special. So that's probably something else that's in the uh, in in this larger edition that uh, that that appears out there. I do 
need to point out, and I'm not going to go into the detail about it, uh, much detail, but this is a flip book. The cover is actually done by Bill Morris from uh, Simpsons Comics fame. But if you flip it over, it says Mr. Magoo Holiday Special with a cover done by Owsley. Now, I don't think it's Jim Owsley, but uh, it, it says Owsley at the bottom. And it's Mr. Mr. Magoo at a ticket counter. And they're celebrating the 100th anniversary of the Wright Brothers' first flight. Because remember, this was 2003 this came out. And Mr. Magoo, because he is nearsighted, or for yeah, I think he's near side. Instead of handing the money to the woman at the ticket counter, he's handing the money to the poster of the Wright brothers, telling them he needs one ticket to go to the exhibit. Not only is there uh, maybe a six or eight page adventure here, but it's a color it yourself adventure. It's a black and white. It's, it's like a coloring book. So if you were a kid and you wanted to color this in, you could. It, it, it's just line drawing. And it's Mr. Magoo going to a, an exhibition about the Wright brothers. Somebody created a replica of the plane. And, of course, Mr. Magoo gets mistaken for an elderly pilot. He thinks he's in a restaurant. He thinks he's being <laughs> seated at a restaurant. The, the woman running the thing thinks he's the, the guest of honor pilot. She puts him into the plane for the photo op. He hits a button. And the plane takes off. Hilarity ensues. His nephew, Waldo, who is part of the cartoon, is in this issue. I mean, is in this story. It's pretty, pretty fun. And um, the title panel, it's not a title page. The title panel has him in the car yelling road hog, which he does at the beginning of his cartoon. I don't know if you remember how his cartoon began. He's driving and he's the one causing all the road problems. And he'd yell road hog. So I thought that that was kind of cool that they they threw that into the uh, into the book, and you know how you were mentioning it's interesting like Frank Miller did work in that holiday special. Mm -hmm. This script is by Michael Yuri. No from kidding, Back Issue Magazine. Yeah, yeah. So you never know whose name you're going to find in these things. But anyway, that was Mr. Magoo's Christmas Carol holiday special, which is a flip book. With Mr. Magoo's holiday special, which is really a color it yourself adventure celebrating a hundred years of flight from the White Wright brothers. That was a fun one. That's so funny because I when we first planned to do this gab bag uh last year, mm -hmm. and I kept with the same the same uh, books that I had chosen for that discussion. I know you, oh, cause you had, perfect. you had talked about the ones you chose last year on your, your solo episode. So you had to choose yes. some new comics for, for our talk. Right. I also had chosen a Christmas Carol at a, a, a Christmas, a, a Christmas Carol adaptation. <laughs> <laughs> Only not as interesting as uh, Mr. Magoo, because mine, my, my choice was, was Batman Noel. And this was, so this was published November 2nd, 2011 by Lee Berme Bermejo. Wait, hold on. Okay. Now, Eric, really, come on. Now I picked cultural icons. I know, that right? Everybody around the world knows Alf, Hot Wheels, and Mr. Magoo. And you picked this obscure character. Yeah. In the show called what now? <laughs> I mean, come on, Eric. I know, Please, right? Do, do your homework. Well, so the the reason I I wanted to uh, choose oh like I said Lee Bermejo did the he did the story and the art so it's his baby. Barbara Chardo was the colorist. Todd Klein letters. I knew about this book, George. I knew about it back in twenty eleven ish when it was being published. I was not aware that it was a retelling of a Christmas Carol starring Batman and and friends. I just thought it was a Batman story set during Christmas had no idea. And, and so January, 2021 is when I discovered because discovered it was a Christmas Carol adaptation, uh, because I was listening to, uh, the comic source podcast and they were spotlighting this, 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 uh, this, uh, limited, was it limited series or 
can't remember if it was issues or if it's all one thing. I thought it was a graphic novel. I, I, could, I could be wrong, but that's what I thought. Yeah, 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 I think you're right. Yeah, graphic novel. Anyway, so I was like, well, here, you know, here it is January 2021. And I'm like, well, I have to read this. It's, it's, it's a Christmas carol. So I have to read it. Right. So I, I, uh, I bought it digitally. I bought it from Comixology and then read it. I'm like, oh, I definitely need to add this to the, <laughs> to the list to talk to, uh, with George about it because it was, you know, it was, it's, it's, it's Bermejo and, uh, you know, he, he just draws things so well. Mm -hmm. Although I will say, his take on Batman, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with Bermejo, Ber, uh, Bermejo's Batman, but he draws everything, you know, the costume, the gadgets, they're all so very realistic looking. So this is a Batman who's wearing basically leather armor and, um, you know, you can, you can practically feel the weight of what he's wearing as he's jumping around and fighting and doing stuff in the panels. It's just, it, it's amazing how much energy that Bermejo is able to impart given mm. that it, he, Batman kind of looks bulky in, in mm -hmm. all this, in all this lightweight armor that he's wearing. So uh, it's, it's a beautifully drawn story. Like I said, it, it's a Christmas Carol, but with Batman as Scrooge. <laughs> uh a dead robin whom i i uh, assume is uh jason todd mm. although the way it was presented i wasn't quite sure if that was really supposed to be jason as as marley uh and then filling out the the go the other ghosts roles are catwoman as the ghost of christmas past but she's also the love interest <laughs> as well superman as the ghost of Christmas present. And I have to say there is the scene where the two are interacting the way that Bermejo and Chardo drew Superman or, or, or you know, um, portrayed Superman. He's literally, you know, he's, he's, he's the sun God of the DC universe, right? He's literally glowing on the page in the scenes with Batman. So that, you know, just the, the idea of the ghost of Christmas present, you know, as we see him in, in various uh, film adaptations, there's usually a light emanating from him. You know, it's about, it's about the, the light dispelling the darkness of, of winter and all that kind of stuff. Right. And, and they do that really well with, with Superman's portrayal in this. I'm reminded, sorry to interrupt, but I'm reminded of that in the Mr. Magoo <laughs> Christmas Carol, only because the ghost of Christmas present, the uh, the ghost has a flame over their head as if it, they're a candle. And as th their time together is running out, she says, oh, our time is limited. And you can, you, you can see throughout that the flame is getting smaller and smaller, which I think is portrayed, maybe portrayed in other, you know, versions that we've seen in other media. But that was a thing from the cartoon that was put into the book. Oh. So did did Superman Superman's light never no like, like the aura never faded right no not really not that okay. I recall mm -hmm. anyway yeah that might have just been a device that they used in the cartoon that's a really neat way to to, to depict that that's cool I like that yeah I totally forgot about it until I read in the comic and then uh, like I said uh, the last ghost here is the Joker playing the Ghost of Christmas uh, yet to come um it was <laughs> like I said the art is gorgeous. <laughs> it's cinematic. Uh, it's it, like I said, it's, you get that realism uh, it, that Bermejo throws in there. And then, uh, but then you get, you get it balanced out by the, the wonderful colors that Barbara Chardo does. Like I said, the, the art's wonderful, yeah. but you know, the story just doesn't really work. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, the, the mental gymnastics that I think Bermejo was trying to do to adapt Batman and his cast of characters to Dickens, a Christmas Carol doesn't yeah. quite work. Mm -hmm. And it's really stretching it a little bit, but I mean, the, the basic, the basic premise is there, right? Uh, mm -hmm. you know, Batman is learning something and in You're the already end, making me think of a choice for a gag bag <laughs> next year. By okay, the way. good. <laughs> you know, in the end, Batman, of course, um, decides to change his ways and do approach things a little differently. 
uh, mm. which I guess is the moral of the story. So anyway, I, I, I liked it. You even get a little uh, bit of a, it's a wonderful life, you know, how things would be if I hadn't lived a moment in the story. So, you know, you get that connection to, so yeah, I, it was, it was nice. Oh, oh. And then I just also want to point out in case people pick this up and who, who haven't read it, but there is a, uh, the scene where Superman leaves and, um, Batman is going to get into the Batmobile and he hits the, the key or, or whatever to get in or to start the, start the car. I forget, I forget which. Anyway, he presses a button and, um, the Batmobile explodes, knocking him down and out. And so the bottom of the page shows him on the ground, but, uh, it fades to black. On the very next page, he's coming out of the blackness, out of the darkness, coming awake, and he's being dragged by the Joker. And I just love that transition between those two moments and those two pages in the way that, that Bermejo drew that and, and, and did the page turn. So that was, that was really, he, he's, he's really good at, at telling, visually telling or, uh, creating a scene. The overall, <laughs> story maybe not as much it didn't quite work as well so i'm trying to remember there was no scene for scene thing about getting the turkey for bob cratchit part was there some there there i'm, try, I'm trying to think of what that was I, I don't sort know of it was, it was it wasn't a turkey uh but right. it, it was basically bruce wayne offering bob um a job and uh, oh, okay. and helping right. out That's, his okay. son tim so, mm-hmm. you know, you, like I say, you get, mm. you get the major beats right, right. to the story. I, I forgot how he had done that part. Okay. Yeah. 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 That's true. I remember. <laughs> anyway, but, so but it, it's a Christmas it was fun. Carol. You really yeah. can't screw it up that much. Uh, well, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> your, your mileage may vary on that, but. Uh... <laughs> uh, so that was fun. Uh, that was a good, good joint down memory lane. I love it. Yeah. So that. That's our that's another gab bag. That's our yeah. gab bag. Yeah. So uh, it mm-hmm. only took another a, a year longer than we anticipated, but mm-hmm. it's a good fireside marathon. <laughs> that's right. As your mm-hmm. as your uh, what's what's the to the grandma's grandmother's house we go over the river and through as you're going over uh-huh. the river and through the woods to to Granny's yes. house or or wherever for the Christmas holiday, mm-hmm. uh, you have some some gab bag to. Uh, to help you pass the time. Well, you know, since we're since we're on that topic, George, I, I just wanted to say uh, to you and to the listeners, happy holidays and uh, yes. happy new year. And I hope everything, hope, hope everybody has a, a great holiday season and a, uh, a wonderful new year coming up. Because you know, things have been not great uh, the last few years so i you know you can only hope that things can only get better right <laughs> that's right and especially this time of year is filled with hope and christmas comics that's right uh, mm-hmm. well you know all you need are comics <laughs> yeah it's my motto and i would like to say to you eric happy birthday oh happy birthday to you too as well george thank you very much we we are both december birthdays and that's right when this show posts our birthdays will be right there around the corner that's so that's true enjoy your birthday along with your holiday yeah thank you very much all righty well that's uh, another gab bag in in the uh, the bag i guess i don't know another another gab bag in the gab bag yeah uh thanks for uh uh coming back uh like i said a year later george and and uh regaling us with uh those those christmas comics and I uh, look forward to what we could do next year. Same here. Like I said, you already put one thought in my head. <laughs> All right. Before uh, we uh, let let the the fine listeners go to their their Christmas parties and uh, gatherings or whatnot, do you want to remind people about uh, Meanwhile the podcast and where they can find you if they want to talk to you more about the comics you discussed or anything else pop culture related? Yes. I am the co-host, one of four, of what I consider a very fun podcast about pop culture, slice of life type of topics, hopefully some things you can relate to. It is called Meanwhile at the Podcast. We post a new show every Saturday morning. We'd like you to subscribe. We love you to use the hashtag live tweet 
while you're listening, because if you wanted to interject, because we would love to have you in on a conversation, but we can only, we, we don't do any live things. So the only way to live do it is while you're listening and you go, you know, George, you were wrong about that. Live tweet it and let me know what I was wrong about. Let me know what you agree with me on and let me know, hey, you know what? I didn't even think about that darn Alf holiday special. I'm going to go back and I'm going to dig it out. Hashtag live tweet. We're at Meanwhile at the Podcast on Twitter. And I'm not even going to mention the other ones because as of right now, we don't really go to them. But we're, <laughs> we're still on Twitter. Check us out. And we're, we're Meanwhile ATP on Twitter. And Meanwhile at the Podcast is the, your next favorite podcast of 2023. All righty. Um, uh, if uh, anybody wants to send me feedback, it's uh, longbarsreview uh, at gmail.com. I have a voicemail slash text number people can communicate to me at uh, 208-953-1841. I'm on the socials, as they say, at Longbox Review everywhere, and or, or you can just visit the website, longboxreview.com. And with that, George, thank you for joining me. Thank you. Listeners, thank you so much, and uh, I will talk to you next year.